Uh, well, the OSPAR Commission is uh, one of a family of regional seas conventions uh, under the flag of UNEP. So there are 18 of these regional seas conventions and action plans. And the OSPAR Commission is a difficult acronym. It stands for Oslo and Paris, merged of two conventions, but responsible for the Northeast Atlantic. Uh, and it comprises 15 governments around the uh, littoral areas of the Northeast Atlantic, plus the European Union, and some 50 observer organizations, that's industry groups and green NGOs that contribute to uh, making regulation and collectively by consensus managing these uh, ocean areas. So in terms of surface area, you're probably one of the largest organizations on the planet. Uh, well, it's, it is large area. It runs from the uh, North Pole down to the Azores and then east to the, to the North Sea. So it's 13 and a half million square kilometers of ocean space. And interestingly, at least 40% of that is area beyond national jurisdiction. So countries have their 200 nautical mile limits, and then beyond that is area beyond national jurisdiction, which is uh, governed through UNCLOS, like all the rest of the oceans, but uh, is the responsibility of the UN agencies, like the International Seabed Authority for the seabed, and, and then uh, for the water column, in our case, OSPAR has a mandate for uh, certain activities there, although not all of them. So we don't have a responsibility for fishing or international shipping. And how would you describe the um, laws of the sea? I'm not talking from on a sort of piratical nature, sort of Francis Drake, but how would you describe the way the, the oceans are, are regulated at the moment from what you've been hearing at, at this conference as well in terms of the environmental regulations and, and the state of the oceans? Um, well, the, the conference is important in terms of understanding what the state of the oceans is and how we can move towards a better system of governance. Um, the United Nations Law of the Sea Convention is the framework under which we all operate, and that was a major piece of negotiation which shouldn't be unpicked, but uh, does need to be interpreted. Uh, and part of the uh, interesting debate with a lot of states is how that's interpreted and how it's interpreted in such a way that doesn't prejudice individual states and their rights um, and it, it requires a balance and it particularly needs to bring together some of the different competent authorities so we have a memorandum of, understand, of understanding with uh, uh, the fishery the regional fisheries management organization in our area NIAFC uh, and we also have an MOU with the International Seabed Authority and the International Maritime Organization. And uh, bringing these organizations together, finding the common ground, is an essential part of uh, partnership and governance when it comes to particularly the, the high seas areas. Uh, and then uh, collectively, for uh, oceans and, and marine areas, there are many, many transboundary issues, and they're being discussed in this. Uh, meeting of the parties as well because biodiversity is affected by pollution streams and or land-based sources that, that affect uh, um, not just one nation's area of sea. And I think many people would be surprised perhaps to hear that um, under OSPAR's jurisdiction, perhaps jurisdiction is the wrong word, but under your, your watch anyway, you have a number of marine um, designated areas which, um, as you were saying, you know, you, you can't fish. Um, in or, or exploiting. Can you give us a bit more details about those areas and the size of them, what the, what the restrictions are and what the regulations are on those areas? Yeah, sure. Um, in 2010, the OSPAR ministers designated six of these high seas marine protected areas uh, and um, a seventh was added this year. So this is an, a, the start of a network and of, of relatively large areas corresponding to important areas along the mid-Atlantic ridge uh, and areas where there are known sea mounts uh, uh, where of significance uh, and and these areas are um, important for biodiversity they're important in terms of productivity as well um, and in terms of uh, in some cases rarity so species like the orange ruffy for example which is a a fish, a very deep dwelling fish. Uh, and uh, in terms of uh, policing or enforcing measures in these areas, this is difficult because they're very far away. 
they're very large, uh, and we're looking at ways of using satellites or of uh, using the uh, vessel management systems uh, of our sister organization, NIAF, to control and regulate and understand the different activities that are there. Um, quite a lot of it's about information exchange and understanding what the threats might be and perhaps anticipating future threats and producing guidance that will uh, help with that. But if I'm uh, the captain of a huge Japanese trawler ship, I don't know why I'm picking up the Japanese, but they always seem to be the bad guys when it comes to fishing, and I go straight through your zone and, and start catching all the fish there and maybe dropping a few deep trawler nets too and scraping the seabed, it's probably too deep. But what, what are you going to do? Um, I think this, this is quite important because the OSPAR Commission can't do anything about that and the OSPAR parties can't do anything about that but the North East Atlantic Fisheries Commission can and it has uh, arrangements and links to other nations outside of the North East Atlantic and so it can take sanctions uh, against certain flag states uh, and, and against landing illegal catches caught in the deep sea. So the role of the regional fisheries management organisations is really important in all of this and it's important that they not only are operational but they, that the work that they do is recognised and, and in a sense um, part of it comes down to economics. If you're not allowed to land your catch in a certain country in any of the North East Atlantic countries Either you've got to take it back to your own country or you've got to sell it somewhere else. And, and that's, uh, that's expensive. Many people seem to think, um, who we've spoken to, that actually having huge marine protection areas in the high seas um, on, a, on a vast scale would be impossible. So from your perspective, what, what are the particular challenges you've faced and what advice you know, do you have for, um, for negotiations on, the, on this subject? I think it is possible. You have to have the background document that explains why it's important. You need the conservation objectives in place that are to be met. You need the scientific and legal uh, answers to a series of questions to make sure you've got the competence to uh, put these designations in place. And then importantly you need the management measures alongside the designations. So we have a management recommendations that run together with each of the designations of these sites.